Thank you, Marjorie. Hello, everybody. Um, all of us here, I think, are in education. Um, and I think one of the reasons we're in education, we stay in education, is because we want to improve in some small way the lives of the students who come before us. Um, our speaker today, Anne Cotton, um, through CAMFED, has massively and directly improved the lives of over 1.2 million students. Um, and those 1.2 million students are probably some of the students in most need of improvement in their lives. Um, Anne is the founder and president of CAMFED, and CAMFED aims to replace the cycle of poverty and equality with a cycle of empowerment and opportunity through giving education opportunities to young girls in rural Africa. Anne got the OBE for this work in recognition of this work in 2006, and last year she was awarded the WISE Prize for Education, which some consider to be the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for Education. So it gives me very, very great pleasure to introduce Anne, Anne um, oh no, Cotton. Sorry, Anne. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Colin, very much, and Marjorie. Uh, you know, it, it's a great honour to be, have been invited to speak to you today. I'm, I'm really thrilled, and thank you uh, very much for you know, being this extraordinary uh, listening audience. I'm also delighted to be back in this great city of Manchester. I spent some years living a little north of here, um, in near Blackburn. And uh, of course, it, it, is, it is a global city, Manchester, which has had a profound impact on the world. And I, was, um, I found it extraordinary last night that I was staying in a, a hotel that is actually on the site of what became known as the Peterloo Massacre. Uh, this was a, a massacre that took place uh, almost, two, almost 200 years ago when people came from all the towns in the area, they marched, uh, there were many women uh, marching with them, and they marched on the issue of suffrage, because at that time, uh, to have a vote meant that you needed to have 40 pounds, and you needed to stand on the public hustings in Lancaster. And this whole area, Manchester and the surrounding towns, had literally two members of parliament. So this was a march for justice, and it was a march that had uh, really tragic consequences, because of course, when you march for justice, you threaten the status quo, and the vested interest in maintaining that status quo decided that they needed to be stopped. And so they sent out the troops. The troops were in readiness uh, in the area, and uh, they were on horseback, cavalry on horseback, and they charged the crowd. And it's disputed as to quite how many died, but um, I think the figure is around 16 people who actually died or subsequently died of their injuries. But many more, literally hundreds, up to 600, were actually uh, severely maimed in what was a battle. Uh, and of course, um, you know, the uh, the change has indeed occurred. So we're here in this great city, um, which has, as I say, had the most profound impact on the world and is uh, an industrial uh, and economic powerhouse, which is once again, I think, really growing. So it's marvelous to, to join you all here. And of course, my journey has been a journey for justice. One for girls in Africa. And when I began, uh, just 22 years ago, the issue of girls' education was not a global priority. It was a marginal issue. It was a gender issue, uh, and particularly uh, for girls in Africa, and particularly for rural girls in Africa. And I set out, really, um, on an education journey. We're all on education journeys, and I had gone back as a mature student to the Institute of Education in London. And I was interested in the issue of gender and, and human rights. 
And I went to uh, a village in Zimbabwe, the village of Mola. I looked at the statistics and found that the area of Nyami Nyami was the poorest in the whole country. It was the area where the Tonga people had been moved when the Kariba Dam was built in 1956. 70,000 people were in the wrong place at the wrong time for them, and they were forcibly resettled onto land that really couldn't support them. And here is a photograph from that village of Mola. As you can see, the land itself looks quite bare and poor. And this is a, a photograph of a class taking place under a tree. When I got to Mola, I thought I was, I was ready. I was going to do a study on girls' exclusion from education. I was going to look at the reasons behind the fact that in this community and in others throughout Zimbabwe, there were seven boys for every girl at school. Now, I had not understood until that point the enormous strides that Zimbabwe had made in its education system. At Independence in 1980, there were 60 places for every thousand black children in a segregated system. All white children went to school, far better resourced schools with trained teachers, and they went free. So Zimbabwe faced uh, the most enormous challenge. And during the first 10 years, they expanded educational access to the tune that there were 600 places for every 1,000 children in a desegregated system. And the energy in education, the enthusiasm for education, was extraordinary, was palpable. And it inspired me. But I realized when I got to Mola that I was entirely unprepared for what I found. I found a level of poverty that I had never before witnessed. This is a child sitting outside her hut. It is indeed the dry season. And you can see the land. It is poor land. This area was resettled because there was nobody there. And there was nobody there because the land was not sufficiently productive to support human life. So in 1956, when people were forcibly resettled, the colonial government said, well, what we need to do is to provide some support for two years. We will provide food aid. <coughs> Excuse me. We will provide food aid for two years, and then people are on their own. But of course, what they'd lost was far more than their land. They had lost a way of life. They had lost access to the river, and theirs was a river culture. They used the river Zambezi to trade, and of course, as a source of food. The protein from the river was an extraordinarily important source of food. But not satisfied with the fact that their land was taken, not satisfied with the amount that was taken from the people by the colonial government. There was a drive now to get the people into work, into the cash economy, because there was a growth in, in Rhodesia, as it was, in southern Rhodesia, of uh, the settler community and the land that was distributed. So they needed workers on the commercial farms. They needed workers in the growing commercial fisheries. But the Tonga people lived a subsistence life. They grew what they ate or they had fished. But of course now, with the lack of a strong uh, food economy, it meant that they were uh, under huge pressure to go into the cash economy. But they still uh, didn't go in the numbers that the colonial government was satisfied with. So the colonial government introduced a dog tax, which meant that if you owned a dog, more, do more, more than one dog, you paid a tax. Then they introduced a hut tax. Now this was a polygamous area, and every wife 
had her own hut. And so in a homestead, there might be seven, eight, nine, ten huts used for different purposes. Each hut was taxed. And if the taxes weren't paid, then you were taken to prison. And beyond that, if you wanted to go on the lake, you had to pay. You now had to buy a fishing license. So the inevitability was, as far as the colonial government would see it, that people would go to work in the commercial fisheries, using their knowledge, using their history. And that is indeed what happened, but it was an economic imperative. And I saw the connection with this history in my own family's history. My family were from South Wales. My family were farmers, sheep farmers in Carmarthenshire. And of course, sheep farming in Carmarthenshire was also a subsistence farming economy. But when the railways arrived in the mid-19th century, it meant that the sheep and the products could now be transported much more quickly and much more economically. And the other thing that happened was that the factories started to produce uh, goods, things like socks, which were now uh, produced by factories. And of course, people thought, oh, much more fashionable, much more desirable than the hand-knitted socks. And my family that had just uh, survived, really, by uh, earning enough, uh, by, by knitting socks, they, the women gathered the balls of wool from the hedges when the, uh, the shepherds and their flocks passed through, and then carded, spun. And the men and the women were involved in the knitting and sold socks, and that now ended. So they moved. Um, with reluctance, to the South Wales mining valley of Aberdare. And of course, they then entered into a very different economy and became, the men became miners, uh, the women were at home and trying very hard to survive in what was a very harsh industrial environment. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, uh, died in the, an accident, and uh, my grandmother left school at the age of 12 and was apprenticed to uh, a, a milliner, a hat maker, uh, and was someone who was absolutely passionate about education through my childhood when I stayed with her. And if I was doing nothing, she used to say, read a book, read a book. Books for her were the way forward. Books for her were terribly important. She was literate, um, and she was passionate about education because she knew what she had lost. And her four children all went on to higher education, including my father, who became a teacher and then a deputy headmaster of a very big school in Cardiff. So that whole uh, history, political history around education, if you like, was in my DNA. And I found it emerging in this village of Mola. I saw in the parents and the grandparents the desire for education that my grandmother had. And it moved me deeply. And I realized that everything that I had read in advance of going to Mola was erroneous for that community. Because what I was expecting to find was resistance to the education of girls. But what I found was not resistance, but a culture of poverty that was so deep that it forced very cruel choices. And I realized that people had been blamed, people were being blamed for their culture, as though that was the reason that girls weren't at school. But I heard the message from everyone I met from parents, from teachers, from the village chief, from children themselves. Yes, girls wanted to go to school. But yes, the local economics favored the education of boys. And it favored the education of boys because they had the freedom to travel. They could go onto the commercial farms and into the commercial fisheries. And in a community with an absence of a social safety net beyond the family, this was crucial. People 
were making decisions that made sense. They weren't making bad decisions. They were making the only decisions that they could on the basis of economics, on the basis of survival. And I found that extraordinary, that I hadn't anywhere in the literature, and this was back in the early 90s, met this idea. I had sat in libraries in Cambridge and London looking and studying this issue. And I found that there was this whole universal approach to the fact that girls weren't at school because of cultural resistance. And I thought, well, if this is the case in MOLA, what about elsewhere? Certainly elsewhere in rural areas of Zimbabwe, but even beyond that, what if? So when I returned home, I felt uh, completely out of my depth, uh, emotionally, intellectually. I had never uh, thought of raising money or being in an organization. I myself have a background in education. I, was a, I started my career as a teacher. But it seemed to me that here was an issue that needed a far wider consideration. Because as we still see today, we see the impact of girls' exclusion from education. We see it in high rates of child mortality. We see it in high rates of maternal mortality. We see it in the lack of food security. We see it in the exclusion of women from the economy. The exclusion from girls has an impact far beyond their own lives. But certainly, you can see it on an individual level. When a girl leaves school at the age of 12 or 13, she will marry. And she will marry because her family are having a hard time sustaining the family. She's growing. She needs more food. She needs clothes. She's growing out of her clothes. And so when an opportunity arises, the family may well say, yes, she can marry you. Her security depends on that marriage. But of course, her security is simultaneously undermined. It is undermined by the fact that she is likely to become pregnant while still a teenager. And she will face pregnancy and labor when the health services are far away one of the most profoundly moving uh, things I heard was how girls in the village, when I was staying there, if they went into labor and they had any difficulties, then the local clinic couldn't cope and they would radio through to the lake, to Lake Kariba. And at Lake Kariba, they would send down a jeep on an unmade road and the girl would travel uh, on the unmade road, on the bumpy road, to, to the lake, which would take about an hour, an hour and a quarter. And from there, she would be taken from the lake shore to Kariba town, where she would be admitted to the hospital. And her treatment was free. But what was not free was the return of her body to her family if she died. And that was going to be uh, something so profound in a family's life that sometimes they decided that they would not allow her to be transferred. And if she didn't die on the journey, which indeed was often the case, she would die at home, trying to give birth when she was so young and immature. And people said to me, even in the clinic, people who were, had not been brought up in the area, these people... They don't care. They don't care about their children. That made no sense to me in human terms whatsoever. I thought this cannot be the case. And yet, people are spoken about in that way. There is always a rationale. And that rationale is almost always economic. 
It's about taking, taking a bet, taking a risk and trying to work out what risk you should take and how you should take it. So if a boy is going to get, give you the best chance of future security when you can no longer grow what you eat, if the boy is going to bring cash back into the family for the kind of circumstances I've just described, then educate sons. So I came back and I embarked now on a mission. I thought, well, I need, I need to explain. First of all, I went to my supervisor and I said, you know, I can't just do this, I can't just study. And she said, no, keep going, keep going. I said, I can't. I mean, I just feel that I have been entrusted with something, that I have to work out what I do with this knowledge. And I faced a real crossroads. I finished my, PA, my, my MA, but I, I did not embark on my PhD, which had been my plan, because I kept deferring it and deferring it. And I'm so utterly glad I did. But that was the crossroads I faced. And so I went around now, uh, not knowing uh, what the next step would be for me, going around to organizations, explaining what I had found. And I found, from those organizations, absolute resistance to what I was saying. I found this extraordinary. And I was angry, not for myself. I wasn't angry for myself because I was a novice. I knew that only too well. I had only just come to this issue. I had been in one community. But I was angry about the closed minds. And I was angry that what I told people about what the community of Mola had said to me was being rejected. And that was what drove me on. In one meeting I had, someone said to me, well, you know, people are telling you what they want you to hear. And I thought, well, how, what would they, how would they know what on earth I wanted to hear? Or were they all on message in some way? As I walked from village to village and hear this consistent message, that made no sense whatsoever. On another, I was just told that people can think there's, there's a benefit that you're going to bring. And so they're just lying. And in many ways, this sort of patronizing behavior made me ever more determined. I had said to Chief Mona, the traditional leader, I said, I will, I will come back. And so I did. I went back to Mona after six months and of course, in those days, uh, was, there was certainly no, apart from the radio uh, at the local clinic, um, there, was, there, was no, there were no telephones, uh, there was no way of, of contacting the community. So I, I literally arrived and I went to see Chief Mola and he said to me, ah, oh, you're back. I didn't think you'd come back. And I said, but I promised. And I said, I'm ready to work with you. I have no idea of <laughs> what to do but you must guide me. And perhaps together, we can make sure that more girls in the community of Mola go to school. And that was how it began. And he said, we'll have a meeting. That was about four o'clock one afternoon. One and a half days later in the morning, I was woken by the sound of voices obviously gathering. I knew this meeting was going to take place at the local secondary school. That's where the photograph under the tree was taken, although they did have some buildings, but not enough. I didn't think that all these voices were heading for Mola Secondary School. But I, as I got ready and I started to walk down the road to the school, I realized they were all going to the school. And I literally arrived to hundreds of people. Hundreds of people who would arrive to discuss the issue of girls' education. And if that wasn't indication and proof of the desire for education of girls in that community, then I don't know what would be. I was profoundly moved by this. And I said to the chief, how did you gather so many people? He said, I gave the message to my sub-chiefs. And then, of course, they were passed on to 
the kraal heads as they're known, and then the heads of households. So the whole community knew about this meeting. And when the chief sends out a message about a meeting on an issue, then people come. Because the chief is the embodiment of the culture of the community. And the chief is a bridge between the traditional world and the modern world, and is trusted. So together we sat at Mola Secondary School, and we discussed how to move forward. And that was how Camford's model was designed. We have moved, as Colin said, we have moved from the first 32 girls to support, directly support the education of over 1.2 million girls in Zimbabwe, in Ghana, in Tanzania, in Malawi, and in Zambia. And we are just about to start work in South Africa. And it was Mola community that taught me how to proceed. And the idea was the child, the child is at the center of everything we do. The child is our client. How often, I wonder, do you think, working in the education context, that the child has to fit the system rather than the system working for the child? We began with the knowledge that we needed to understand girls' experience both outside and inside the education system. And she is our client. We actually articulated this in a document uh, called Accountability to the Girl. We were being asked um, about five years ago for our model People asked us, how many uniforms do you provide? You know, when do you provide the school fees? And these were the wrong questions. That detail uh, is, happens differently in different contexts. The question is, you know, how, how do you do this? How do you build a community around this, this issue? How do you build a culture that is accountable, first and foremost, to the child? And the governance document that we produced essentially describes that. How every single action you take needs to be accountable first and foremost to the child. And so that is how we think of our work. That is how we design our work. And we think about the different forms of capital that are available. In that community in Mola that day, I learned so much. I learned that everything that I had read, I could just abandon and literally begin again in this teaching ground. You know, there's um, a shepherd um, in the Lake District who's become um, becoming quite a celebrity, although I'm not sure he would, he would appreciate that word, James Rebanks. Uh, he's written a book called The Shepherd's Life, a, a marvelous book. And in it he says, uh, I have found that, um, I'm paraphrasing here, but I have found that I have learned so much uh, from people who are semi-literate, that they're some of the most intelligent people that I, I have met. And you know, so often we think of language, written language, as the expression, don't we, of intelligence, because that's the measurement system that we had, we have. But here, in the community of Mola, I found a, le a depth of wisdom and intelligence that I found really profound and continue uh, to find profound. And that's how ca all Camford's initiatives are in fact designed and built. So we think of the model as being uh, a system that draws capital together. We think of financial capital, don't we, as the primary 
uh, form of capital sometimes, the form of capital that unlocks uh, change. But, you know, if we negotiate every uh, action, every uh, initiative through the lens of financial capital, then all we will do is remind people of what they don't have. Poor people already feel uh, excluded, marginalized, disrespected. We have to change that and put them in the primary position, in the pole position, as the educators, as the designers, and that's what Camford does. So what is the social capital that we draw upon? Well, it's vast. And of course, every community, however poor, runs because of its social capital. You have your vast social capital in this community, as social capital that will grow as a result of this conference. So the fact that the chief brought uh, the community together, the social capital through which they were connected one to another and uh, to the children and their families and to the education system itself. That's what we saw that day. That's what I saw that day. But then you think, well, and this was one of the things they said at the meeting, we can't have a meeting like this every time we have to discuss something. No, uh, it would have been <laughs> unworkable. So what do you do to formalize and draw upon and institutionalize social capital? So at that meeting, what was discussed was what kind of representation would there be on a community committee that would move things forward? This, and they decided that this was not to be exclusively in the realm of education. We could, of course, have had a committee made up entirely of educationalists. We could have had the head teacher and the teachers at the school, and we could have had the local education officer. And then we would have put the education of children firmly in the hands of the education sector. But as we know, education works, works far better when there are far wider range of stakeholders involved. And so it was decided that yes, of course, the education system would be represented, both the school itself and the local education office. And that the traditional leader would be represented either he would be the representative or he would nominate someone uh, to um, represent him on the committee. Then the local health system, the clinic, of course, involved in the welfare and health of children, and particularly so in a poor community. If a teacher sees that a child is sick, if a child faints in the classroom from hunger, then uh, the teacher can alert the clinic uh, and the parents when you're thinking about the education of child, the child in a holistic way. Of course, this was a patriarchal society. The, the educators were almost all men, the uh, chief, of course, uh, the clinic staff. Uh, this was an area where men were making it through the education system, uh, and so um, there were not women in positions of authority, but women needed to be on the committee. And this was the point at which I raised my voice. I listened for 99% of the time, and I said, you know, girls like to be able to tell their difficulties, their problems, to a woman. And there was general agreement on this. So it was decided that the mother support group, the local mother support group, the mothers who got together and ran play groups and had gardens, that they would be re the, the mother would be represented, a mother would be, the mother support group would be represented. And so this committee became the central uh, committee. Uh, and that's one of the examples of how uh, the institutionalization, if you like, of the social capital uh, takes place. The knowledge capital. I am going to talk um, a, a little and more at length on this issue. Um, because I think the issue of knowledge and data is such a political one and is so fundamentally important and has such power. 
Uh, now, I was in Malawi um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, the Malawi, Malawi had some severe floods, and we haven't yet seen the impact of these floods. The harvest uh, currently underway will be well down, and it means that families will start running out of food in November. And that means they have to survive until uh, the following April. It's going to be um, a very, very difficult time uh, in a country that already experiences food insecurity. And I was uh, at one of the preschools that we have established uh, at a primary school with the community. And the mothers, in fact, are running uh, this. The food is... Uh, grown locally on land given by the mothers, given to the mothers by the chief, and then it is, um, provide, you know, they, they purchase with grants they get from us, they purchase additional nutritional items like groundnuts, for example, added, so that the children every morning have uh, nutritious porridge. And one of the mothers, um, and most of the mothers um, didn't go to school, at least didn't have more than a few years of primary school education, um, and uh, they are, you know, what one would uh, term semi-literate, and semi-literate in their mother tongue. And I, one of the mothers said to me, you know, some of the children uh, we give extra to, and I said, how, how do you know uh, who needs extra support, who needs extra food? And she said, we can tell by the way they eat. And I found that so, you know, so extraordinary that where would you read that, you know, um, uh, in, in a textbook? Where would you read that, that actually the manner in which a child eats is something that can tell the local health services, the local schools, how that child, um, how that child's, uh, what's the child's nutritional base? And of course, the sensitivity of the mothers to that. So always for us, as in MOLA, whichever country we're working in, that's, that's the knowledge base. But what happens to knowledge generally? You know, data collection is a massive uh, and important industry. Imagine a scenario where uh, one of the big international agencies wants to know um, how many orphans there are in the country. So the word goes out. Uh, to the Ministry of Education, you need to count orphans. And the Ministry of Education uh, talks to the provincial uh, heads of education, and the provincial heads talk to the district education, and then the message goes down to the schools. And the teacher walks into the classroom and says, hands up if you are a single orphan. Hands up if you're a double orphan. And the children put their hands up, reminded yet again of their loss, reminded yet again of their pain. What about the social process by which we gather knowledge and data? You know, when uh, HIV and AIDS was, it remains, of course, the most enormous issue, but in the um, late 90s, massive investment in understanding this. I remember someone coming to me to ask me if I would support their application to do a PhD uh, and uh, talk, talk to him about how he was going to be a, go about it. He wanted to, us to open the doors, if you like, to villages in Zimbabwe. I said, you know, we can't, we're not in a position to do that. That's not how we work. This is, would be entirely through the Ministry of Health. Tell me how you want to go about it. And he said, well, I, I, I want to understand how many sexual partners people have had in the last previous six months. And I said, well, how do you propose to find that? He said, oh, I'm going to you know, go around the village. And I said, do you know what I would do if somebody came to my house <laughs> and asked me, how many sexual partners have you had in the last six months? And he looked at me and I said, I would call the police. <laughs> but you know, there is that intense arrogance about thinking that the poor are a set of data and that somehow we are entitled to know 
details about the lives of poor people that we are not prepared, uh, if you like, uh, middle class, uh, to give. So for us, the social process by which we gather information is fundamentally important. But beyond that, what happens to the data when it's collected? Well, it goes up the system. Of course, that data is collected in the classroom, it gets aggregated at the district level, and it moves on and on and on up. And it doesn't go back to the community. But the power of data is huge. The power of data to change behavior, the power of data to acknowledge behavior. We work with grandmothers, of course, because many of the uh, generation of parents um, have, in fact, um, died, and grandmothers have become the main carers of children. And grandmothers, for the most part, in the rural areas of Africa where we work, are not, uh, have not had an education. But again, as James Ribank says, you know, the intelligence absolutely is there, and they are ready to learn and listen as to how they can change. They can change the educational outcomes for their grandchildren. So we have meetings in the community. And at those meetings, we discuss how, how data, uh, how we gather data, and, and, and what it's telling us. We looked at the issue of domestic chores in the household. And the pattern is generally, you know, girls do the domestic chores, uh, boys might, you know, take the livestock to the field, or, but girls generally spend a considerable amount more time. And you'll hear people say things like, well, you know, boys, boys break cups, or, you know, they won't be so careful. And we've said, well, actually, you know, unless you provide girls with a space and time to study, then they will not perform as well as the boys. And that's what we see oftentimes in the examination results. And so we looked at this issue. We looked at this issue with parents and grandparents. And then I was at a meeting up in Ghana, northern Ghana, Muslim community, uh, on the border with Togo, and we were sharing the results, the academic results. And we had seen, in three years, clear improvements. And everybody can understand a graph that's going up. And so the grandmothers and the parents were absolutely celebrating because they felt that what they had done had played a huge part in this new educational outcome. And of course, creates a new level of energy and, and commitment. So let's understand, you know, the power of data in the hands from those from whom it's collected. Now, in terms of our institution, what we did was we thought, 1998, my colleague, Lucy Lake, who is now Camford's CEO, we realized that girls were coming out of the school system now with our support, but what they didn't have was the means to find work, they were still going to be very vulnerable if they went to the city. And so we realized we needed to move beyond secondary level education with them. They actually now had the most enormous capital, capital that was now available in their lives and for their communities and their future families. So it was about protecting them. It was about enabling uh, them to grow their capital and make a uh, significant change and lead change. And we established CAMA. Now, what do you know, powerful uh, elites do when they want to really consolidate their power? Well, they, they form alumni, because the alumni becomes a powerful network whereby you support each other. Well, why not girls in rural areas of Africa? Why can't they have an alumni? So that's exactly what we did. So with the first 400, we established the alumni organization. It is run by them. They elect their own leaders. And of course, some of the members now are in their mid-30s. I'll introduce you to uh, a few. And they themselves are taking initiative. So beyond their own families, this is outside their own families, they are supporting the education of children. And in 2013, they supported the education, 63,274 children. 
This is the force. This is the force for change. This is the force for change that is comfort. Increasingly, young women are leading uh, the whole movement. I want to introduce you to a few of them. This is Ruka, Ruka Diliman. She is from northern Ghana, and as I mentioned, uh, we work in, in Ghana, we work in the north, and north is, is, is mainly Muslim. And you know, the reason we went to Ghana uh, was because people were saying to us, well, it, will wo it works in Zimbabwe. You know, people are always like to find reasons as to why things won't work, particularly in Britain, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, telling me all the time, yes, well, of course it will fine, you know, it's working in Zimbabwe, um, but it won't work uh, in a Muslim community. And I had colleagues in Cambridge, one from the north of Ghana, who said, it'll work. The desire is there. And indeed, it did. Interestingly, since Camford's inception, not one single family has turned down the offer of support for their daughter. Not, not one in the whole history of Camford. And so Ruka is from the north, and Ruka decided that what her community needed was more fresh protein, actually grown in the community um, and, uh, you know, something which was um, going to be at, at, at the right cost so it wouldn't attract all the, the transport costs, the refrigeration costs of, of goods that travel um, often from the south. So she decided to start a chicken farm. And that chicken farm has grown. It's grown to uh, uh, produce other, um, uh, uh, other animal husbandry going on. And she has employing people, so she's become uh, not only the pr provider of local protein, she's, she's a, 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 an employer, she's a wealth creator, and she's an incredible role model. And her community are celebrating her. They're not trying to hold her back. They're saying, look, often in a community, you talk about a girl or a young woman, people will, will describe that young woman as the daughter, daughter of the community. Look what our daughter is doing. And just imagine how the, her community felt when last year she went to Washington. She was awarded a Mandela Washington Scholarship by President Obama uh, of 25, and she had $25,000 to go with that award uh, to acknowledge the extraordinary uh, distance that she had traveled in terms of establishing and growing her business. And there's, you know, she's absolutely unstoppable. So they're moving into, onto the global stage, and they are moving uh, very successfully uh, within their communities and their nations. This is Raniararo. I've known Raniararo since 1991, in fact. And she wrote to me after I met her and said, if only I get the chance, I will do something great. A very poor family. Her father was very sick and knew that he would not be able to grow enough to support the education of his daughter. Uh, he was very worried about that, and we supported her. She was one of the first 32. We supported her into the local uh, mission school, St. Francis of Assisi, and she was top. Uh, this was a, a, a largely middle-class school. We supported 21 girls into that school, a largely middle-class school where, um, you know, children now, the new growing middle class of Zimbabwe, they had TVs at home, you know, they certainly, many of them had cars. Really, her had never been in a car. She didn't have electricity at home. She'd never switched on a tap until she came to school. And by the end of the fourth year, the fourth year exams, she was top of all the girls in that school. And she elected to do sciences. And she did physics, maths, and chemistry. She got straight A's. She went to the University of Zimbabwe to do medicine. And she's now uh, a doctor in Namibia. She's married to a chemist uh, with two children, and she's very, very active in her local church and community. And she said to me, you know, when I see nurses sometimes being unkind to a poor woman who comes to the hospital, I say, don't speak to that woman that way. She could be my mother. And she said, they're shocked because they don't think that someone like me in a white coat comes from a rural background. So, you know, it's not only the fact of their progression. 
It's the fact that they understand the context of poverty. They have a profound understanding of the psychology of poverty, as well as the material impact of poverty. So their change making is way beyond uh, the change making of, I think, what would happen if a child without this background went into this context. Because in institutions, much remains invisible to those who haven't been at the sharp end of that experience. This is Abigail, Abigail Kayindu. Kayindu is her, her second name. She is also a leading member of Kama. And I met Abigail um, in about 1999. We traveled on a bus together for about two hours, during which she told me her quite remarkable story. Her mother died uh, following her father's death, and she went to live uh, with an uncle and aunt. And uh, she, she didn't feel happy there. She was doing a lot of domestic and agricultural chores. And she ran away. She was a very young child. She ran into the forest. And a local forester found her and took her back uh, to his, his wife. It's like a, like a fairy tale. Took her back to his wife. And they saved. She had. She knew the village where her grandmother lived. She knew she'd been there as a child with her mother. And she wanted to go to her. And they saved the money. And they put her on the bus with an address of the village. And off she went to find her grandmother. And arrived in that village. And indeed, her grandmother welcomed her with open arms. A very, very old lady who is now in her uh, early 90s and unutterably proud of her daughter. Because her daughter is on Ban Ki-moon's uh, education advisory group for youth. And I was in um, Dubai recently, uh, speaking at a, at, at a conference, and someone came and put their hand over them, over my eyes, and said, guess who? And it was Abigail. And she uh, was in Dubai for a meeting of, of that group and, and saw that I was on the speakers and came to find me. And so she, again, is someone who's on the global stage influencing influencing change, and Angie. Now, Angie is our regional director in Africa. Angie is, well, I have known since about 1992. Angie is the most extraordinary powerhouse. She is, is brilliant uh, intellectually. She's a brilliant leader. And here she's speaking at uh, the Brookings, the, uh, at the education think tank last year. She spoke just before Michelle Obama. And these are four young women, none of whom would have even gone on to secondary education. What a loss. What a loss for them. What a loss for their families. What a loss for their nations. What a loss for the world. It really uh, is something so profoundly important if we want change, if we are serious about the eradication of poverty, then we need to educate every child. We need to make sure that girls are in the education system and that when they're in the education system, they are valued and protected. And then they emerge as these extraordinary global leaders who are fighting for change, for others like them. So that is the story, in a, in a nutshell, of CAMFED over the past uh, 22 years. It's a, it's a strong personal story for me. Uh, it's a story of how I began with nothing, really, um, with um, I responded I think first and foremost with my heart and then uh, with my head. And that's the way it has been, that this issue is uh, somehow, you know, in the, in the organization itself, we, are, we, we, we move forward uh, with our heads and our hearts. 
And this is how I think we have reached uh, such an extraordinary position as influencers of the whole issue um, in, 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 girls, in the girls' education movement in the world, which is, which is indeed where we are. And I know that all of you are, of course, um, professionally involved in teaching English as both a foreign language and English um, as a, uh, as now there are two, two sides, there's the English as a foreign language and then there's the English as um, second language, yes. <laughs> there's a differentiation which I hadn't actually thought about until I started to really look hard at your organization. And of course, I, and I want, uh, before I close, just to um, round up with, with this issue. When I went to MOLA, uh, I realized that children were learning, not in their mother tongue when they arrived at primary school, but in the first, lang the first mother tongue language of the country, which was Shona. Because in MOLA, nobody was getting through this, had got through the school system in order to become uh, a teacher, in order to go through the professional, uh, their own education and through the professional, um, uh, you know, um, the professional need, need, the professional courses. So it meant that teachers were posted by the education authorities to MOLA. And so the children came to school, imagine, you know, they, they came to school speaking Tonga, their mother tongue, and the teacher spoke Shona, and somehow <laughs> they needed to find a way to communicate. Very, very difficult. And then, when they moved on to secondary school education, English was a language of instruction. Now, in MOLA, there was no, you know, there was no, you can imagine, in this community, there, there were no billboards, there was no electricity, so there were no radios, there were no television, there were no news newspapers occasionally would arrive and they'd be three weeks old, they'd be passed around carefully. But well, English was the only place where children spoke English was in school. Imagine the challenge. I mean, really, you have to be a linguistic genius to have, to have handled the language issues uh, around that. So um, one of the very first things we did was uh, we worked with the local uh, teacher training college to reduce, and we worked with the Ministry of Education, of course, to reduce the requirements for uh, entry for the Tonga people into um, into, into training college so that they bec could become teachers because the reality was that they, they you know, this, wasn't, this cycle, this, this vicious cycle was not going to be broken. So that was one of the things we, had, we did. Now, it, one of the other things that we have done is thought about the materials, of course, and a lot of the materials do not reflect, uh, aside from the language issue, they do not reflect the children's experience. They do not reflect the rural culture. They do not see photographs in their books of children who look like them, of people who look like their parents. Uh, they don't see names of uh, uh, you know, places that they're familiar with. So you almost sort of enter into this educational um, environment that feels somehow detached from you that feels somehow remote from you. So what we've done is we have been working, actually with Pearson Publishing, on a, a curriculum for uh, these circumstances to reflect back to children their experience. So for example, if you get a maths question, uh, I was looking at one in some of our materials uh, last night, uh, you get a maths question that talks about train timetables, for example. And the, uh, you know, you talk, talk about in Tanzania, talk about Dar es Salaam and Ngorogoro. So these are names, these are places which the children are familiar with. So they don't, you know, find themselves, um, you know, with a train timetable that looks at the distance from London to Manchester, which of course means absolutely nothing to them. I always remember with the 11 plus, I had a question on my 11 plus paper 
on the um, mechanical arithmetic, which was about cricket. I was 11, growing up in Cardiff, and it was about cricket runs. I'd never heard of... My father liked cricket, but I didn't really, you know, wasn't into the whole culture of cricket, and uh, I just, he watched it on the television, and, and it was, this person got so many runs, and this person got so many runs, and this person bowled and batted, and all the rest of it. And I remember looking at this question and being really confused by it, because, I'm, you know, I didn't understand the basis of the question. And I went home, and I told my father about this, and he said, well, you, you know, he, he was obviously a teacher and <laughs> wanted me to uh, do, do well. And, 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 he, and I, I said, you know, there was this question about cricket and runs. He said, oh, you knew. And, and of course, my father, who, who taught me a great deal, he wouldn't have thought about teaching me a maths question on cricket. Uh, I'm sure I didn't pass that particular question because I, was, I, I really struggled with it. But this is what children are facing. They're not only facing the language barrier, they're facing the barrier around the particular metaphors or the particular examples around which they are expected uh, to negotiate and understand. So in our partnership with Ministries of Education and with Pearson Publishing, what we have done is develop a curriculum which is precisely targeted at rural children. And it has been very successful. Now, there are the materials themselves, um, and they have been developed, actually, with CAMA. So with the CAMA alumni, CAMA network of young women, of course, who speak the local language, who have all the metaphors, who have all the stories, they have worked with consultants at Pearson on developing these materials. But beyond that, we started to look at the issue of how Teachers could be helped in the classroom to introduce these materials. We have very large numbers of young women coming out of secondary education, some, you know, for the first time in their communities. You know, there are large numbers of young women. And I talked about the fact that, you know, the job creation. What about those who want to go on to teaching, of whom there are many? So we have established something called Learner Guides. The Learner Guide program is a program that enables young secondary school graduates to go into their local schools to work alongside teachers, most of whom will not be from the local area. So it works on so many different levels. The teachers feel supported, of course, because classes Class sizes are often very large in the context in which we work, maybe 50, 60 children. There is this fantastic language bridge. The children in the classroom know the learner guides themselves. So the learner guides are a friendly face, and they also are role models. So people to whom the children can aspire to be like. Because if your teachers are all coming in from outside, you wonder, is this, is this something for me? Is this something I can do? Can I take this authority? Parents are delighted because they can see that their, their daughters are actually moving forward and are you know, respected in their communities. And this is then a bridge to teacher training college. So teacher training college then is the next step. And we support then these young women into teacher training college. So it's working from every point of view. So that is one of our initiatives, um, which I think particularly relates to your work. I'm going to, I've, I'm not sure if Colin's waved, but I think he probably has. <laughs> and so I just want to say that, um, you know, it's been my pleasure to, to share this with you. And I, I want to finish with the words of Mark Twain who said, you know, when everybody thinks the way you do, then it's time to think differently. <laughs> and I think as a community of educators, you all have such creativity, so many ideas, and I wish you all uh, the very best, you know, moving forward at this conference and into the future, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
say that now? 